So this is the final lecture of this conference, and my apologies for presenting it to you in this format rather than having been with you in person um, at the, 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 uh, the Friday at the end of last week. Um, I was prevented from being there by, by train problems in Paris. Um, but it's perhaps not inappropriate that this lecture should be a little disconnected from, from the others because the approach I'm taking here in this final lecture is a little bit different. I want to stand back from the political, the social issues, the controversies that have inevitably, inevitably dominated the discussions so far, and to take you into the interior, the private world of Puritan experience. I should say that since I first started my researches along these lines more than 15 years ago, I've become convinced that an essential frame, maybe the essential frame for the history of religion is the history of emotions. Belief, identity, culture, politics, all of the things that make the history of Puritanism important, none of these things make any sense unless we understand the motives of Puritans and anti-Puritans, what actually makes them care about these issues enough to reshape their lives around them. As they themselves would say, the difference between the godly, the hotter sort of Protestants, and the mere carnal Protestant who assumes that identity but sits loosely to it, that difference is not principally one of doctrine. It's one of intensity, of earnestness. So the question I'm asking today of what it actually means to live one's life as a Puritan is not, I hope, a curiosity at the end of a conference, but the issue which underlies everything else. And what I want to do in this short lecture is to give you some hints about how they understood their lives and the meaning of their lives and what consequences that might have had. And I need to begin by apologizing for my title. I chose The Puritan Life, but I was wrong. There is no such thing. This was a deeply individualistic religious culture. There's not one shared life, life, but many individual lives, each with their own distinct meaning, leading each person to their own distinct judgment. These Puritans are incubating what was then a novel idea, that every elect Christian had a life story, which was a coherent story, a progressive narrative in which the spirit providentially leads the believer on a, a winding but sure path to heaven. Discerning the meaning of your own life story while it's going on is difficult, but the principle that every life lived under God must have a coherent meaning of this kind was unmistakable. It was one of Puritanism's greatest sources of consolation. Even disasters, even failures are embraced within God's plan. And it gave the Puritan life the distinctive restless dynamism, which I would argue is one of its most pervasive qualities. So another apology. My title might suggest I'm going to talk about the regular rhythms and routines and normal everyday life of a Puritan, which is an interesting and important subject. But Puritans are suspicious of normality, of stasis or rhythm. To develop a set of religious habits and to remain within them was for them a kind of death. They looked for a spiritual life which was linear, cyclical. They wanted to move from conversion through higher and greater knowledge and holiness until death. Spiritual progress became essential and backsliding, a very Protestant word that, became fatal. This is how Archbishop Sands put it. Walk on, in a, in a side sense. Walk on, he says, go forward. For if ye be in the way of life, not to go forward is to go backwards. Take heed of backsliding. Go on from strength to strength, from virtue to virtue. God grant that there be not a retiring from strength to weakness, from virtue to sinful. 
So if your life does not display this kind of progress, you have a problem. The Protestant theology of sanctification underpinned all this. One of the keys to Martin Luther's theological breakthrough was his separation of justification, which is the, the declaration that a sinner is righteous in the eyes of God, separation justification from sanctification, which is the lifelong process of actually becoming righteous, the declaration against the reality. And that distinction requires that the justified person will in fact progress towards virtue. You can, if you overlie that with Calvinist predestination, the implication you reach is that anyone whose progress towards virtue stalls or reverses may in fact never have been justified at all. This means, in theory at least, that the re redeemed sinner's life should have a very distinct shape. This is how the Puritan agitator Thomas Wilcox put it. If you be not now, as in regard of spiritual graces, in better estate than you were long ago, fear your condition. If you are not growing, in other words, you are as good as dead. It was said that standing water putrefies and rots. Stagnation might even be worse than a spectacular fall into sin, because that could at least spark appalled repentance. It was a commonplace for Puritan preachers that every day Christians should leave some sin. They should daily proceed further and further from virtue to virtue. Every day grow until we come to perfection. Daily progress was accepted as a sign of election. In other words, this is unremitting and relentless. The obvious result was fear of backsliding into sin, but that's not all. Nicholas Byfield, a great Puritan preacher, insisted that the Christian must carefully persevere in his first love. That is, maintain the emotional and spiritual heights of conversion, undimmed throughout life. That emphasis on preserving our first love, the phrase was, 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 was picked up from the book of Revelation, that's very widely cited. To wax cold in our love, wrote the Essex Puritan Richard Rogers, was an intolerable treachery. The problem, of course, is that this kind of steady, progressive sanctification, this maintenance of these emotional heights, does not fit very well with real life. How to square that circle was a major preoccupation of Reformed Protestant piety. There were several possibilities. One was to set yourself the right pace. After all, progressive sanctification should be a lifetime's work, not a day's or a year's. And saints could afford to take their time. They might even be wise to do that. If we had learnt but every year one virtue since we were born, Thomas Tim wrote, we might by this time have been like saints among men. That at least sounds like a manageable pace it might make sense to avoid tackling your sins too quickly. You want to leave yourself something to do in future. Another possibility was to distinguish between perception and reality. After all, if you feel yourself to be far from God, you should remember the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints and trust that you are not. John Dodd, that one of the great preachers of the Jacobean period, confronted those who felt their corruptions stirring more violently and temptations rushing upon them more fiercely than ever before. He says this is not a sign of backsliding, rather the opposite. Now that their sin has had a deadly blow, now that, that it, has, it has been all but defeated, it begins like a mad bull in the same case to rage more furiously, because the devil only pays attention to those who are threatening to escape from him. But 
all the arguments, backsliding was an unavoidable lived experience. It, it was a commonplace that those who were once fervent were all too likely to grow formal and cursory, cold and heavy in their religion. And, and, and there's, a, there's a life course aspect to this, the sense of being becalmed during the long years of middle age was, was particularly prevalent. The diarist Margaret Hobie expressed her frustration with it, writing, and this is an absolutely typical entry, I continue in my accustomed exercises, her daily devotions, but my increasing in, go in God's ways is not as I thirst for. The experience of sanctification didn't match the theory. Some Puritans dealt with this by trying to complicate the narrative of sanctification. And perhaps God intends us to leave our first love behind as our faith matures, or God expects our progress to ebb and flow like the tides or like the seasons. Maybe he even trains us in holiness by withdrawing his felt presence. But the more common response was to focus not on ephemeral feelings, but on actual sins. Sanctification, of course, ought to mean becoming less sinful. Now, a sin of some kind is inescapable in this world, all Protestants knew that. But Puritans hoped that while they were still sinners, they might be sinful in a different way than the reprobate. John Preston argued that a particular offence, a, a single sin, does not offend God so much as if we grow to a general rebellion against him. In other words, when the elect sin, it's out of character, whereas the reprobate make a habit of it. This is, of course, very close to the traditional Catholic distinction between mortal and venial sins. And in the 17th century, we find that distinction creeping back into Puritan usage, sometimes using those very words. A variant to this approach emphasized repentance rather than sin. Everyone sins, but the elect match daily sin with daily repentance. The reprobate just keep on sinning. And so this argument goes, believers may be surprised or tempted into sin against their better judgment. The difference is that if you fail to repent, that is a sign of deliberate obstinacy and so of reprobation, which is all very well. But it could become a fixed pattern to repent, return to the same sins and repent again. This, Thomas Hooker said, was to be stuck like a horse in a mill, always turning but never moving. He calls this the mill of prayer. To repent and repeat was to mock God. The author of one Puritan commonplace book wrote, I'm weary of repenting. The often vows and promises of amendment in our private and public humiliations and our as often relapses into the same and worse iniquities makes God weary of repenting. Thomas Goodwin remembered having been stuck in such a pattern in his own youth, and as a, in retrospect, he saw the entire cycle as having been steeped in sin. Nobody wanted their life story to be a tale of a dog returning to its vomit. There was only one approach, I think, which recognised the reality of recurrent sin and also was able to make a satisfying and plausible life narrative. And this was to make repentance not a routine event, but a transformative one. If there's a step back, there must be two steps forward. Repentance must be an occasion of closing one chapter and opening one another. If you fall, you must bounce back higher. And so this was the perennial struggle of the Puritan life, to stop, to prevent oneself from sinking into mere routine. And we can follow this battle in Puritan prayer books. 
one of the recurrent features of these books are, are texts which are ostensibly intended for repeated use, but which would in practice be almost impossible to use routinely. Take, for example, this prayer of John Norden's from the 1590s, where he has his readers say, I do unfeignedly condemn all my former life to be most vile, determining in my heart by thy grace to forsake sin and cleave unto godliness. That particular theme, asserting that the moment when one says the prayer is a decisive turning point in your life story. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. This is a recurrent one, and we find it in private prayers as well as in published books. So the Northamptonshire gentlewoman Grace Mildmay in her manuscripts, you will find this prayer. She says, I do confess that I am not worthy of the least benefit which thou, O God, hast bestowed on me from my birth unto this day, and that I have neglected my service and mine obedience unto thee continually in all the whole course of my life past. I do most humbly present myself before thee with a full purpose and intent by thy grace from this time forward to seek and learn to know my blessed Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now, if you were to read that in isolation, it looks like a turning point in her life, a new conversion. But in fact, it's a completely unremarkable passage in her writings. Every day was supposed to be a new beginning. And when regularity was prescribed, it positively defied any idea of routine. So uh, John John G's best-selling book, Steps of Ascension Unto God, I mean, the relentless progress is there in the title. Um, in this book, he required his readers to pray this every Monday morning. He says, or his, his, his devotees say, we are beginning the week, but alas, we begin not to be reformed in our lives and conversations, but the more weeks pass over our heads, the greater burden of sin we take upon our backs. Thomas Tim, who we met before, instructed his readers to review their sins every single night. And to do so, he says, with this resolution in thyself, to spend the remainder of thy life after a better manner and with better conscience than heretofore thou hast done. And then you have to make the same resolution the following night and the night after that. This kind of thing did risk becoming a little silly. Attempting to keep the Puritan life from fossilizing into routine by sheer intensity of rhetorical bombardment. But what could they do to avoid that terrible fate? Most Puritans were established in their religious identity in their teens or early 20s. So they could have to live a life of this kind of ever accelerating intensity for half a century or more. Now, maintaining a continuous sense of the presence of God in your life is an aspiration for Christians of all kinds. It's a perennial theme of devotional writing. It's worth Noticing, indeed, the extent to which Puritans drew on the wider resources of this tradition in pursuit of this end. They were reading medieval, even contemporary Catholic devotional works alongside their own. But Puritans do have their own distinct approach to this perennial problem. And that was their cultivation of a sense of permanent crisis. Protestantism was born in crisis and in conflict, and it's through those experiences that Puritans found their identity and met their God. The earliest reformers had exulted in the fact that they were weak, isolated, and persecuted because they knew that God disciplines those whom he loves. So one of the problems that English Puritans had in the long years of civil peace after 1560 was that they were not actually being persecuted or in any real danger. They did their best to turn threats of invasion or disasters like outbreaks of plague 
into existential crises. And we shouldn't underestimate how apocalyptic a major epidemic could feel. But of course, ordinary life has dangers enough of its own to make a permanent sense of crisis possible if you look for it. If nothing else could serve, Puritans fell back on the plain fact that death might come at any time. John Andrews urged his hearers, both young and old, to imagine that the spring of our days are past, our summer is spent, that we are arrived at the autumn or fall of the leaf. The lamp of our lives lieth twinkling upon the, twinkling upon the snow. Now, we've got plenty of evidence that this worked, that Puritans who suspected they might be settling into a routine used thoughts like this to shock themselves into religious seriousness. But while life is indeed short and unpredictable, it's also full of false alarms. Um, once you spend a few decades not dying, then you can get used to that state of affairs. Any technique that you can use to shock yourself into awareness can be dulled by repetition. The repentance which is accompanied by hot tears one day becomes part of the mill of prayer the next. And so as preachers ratcheted up their rhetorics, audiences became progressively more inured. The great Puritan preacher Arthur Dent urged, although we could never be moved with any sermon hitherto, yet let us now be moved once at last, which is a powerful appeal to be sure. But then what is the next preacher supposed to say to top that? It was commonplace to urge audiences and readers that now, the present moment, was the time for repentance. That it should and could be a moment of crisis in their lives. Throughout the published text of Gilbert Primrose's fast sermon, The Christian Man's Tears, the word now was capitalized to emphasize the urgency of his call to repent. But how many calls can an audience hear before they suspect that a creature is crying wolf? There was not a foolproof solution to these problems and the anxiety that they generated is one of the main things that I want you to notice. But let me finish by noticing one of the most widespread solutions that was adopted, which is to borrow crises, especially borrowing them from the past. And in England, that meant the persecution of the 1550s. John Fox's Book of Martyrs needs to be recognized as one of Puritanism's most important devotion texts. Conventicles read it aloud to one. They Essex Puritan Samuel Ward promised readers of it that the very pictures of the fires and martyrs cannot but warm thee. The abridged versions of Fox's book, which were published in the late 16th and early 17th century, tend not to concentrate on the cruelty of the persecutors or on the doctrines, which Fox's book as a whole documents so painstakingly. Instead, it focuses on the constancy of the martyrs and their deaths, their prayers, their words of comfort, their readiness for suffering. To read these martyr stories was almost inevitably to ask yourself, what if it were me? And this kind of vicarious, indirect suffering brought a thrill of fear to Puritan readers. In the 1580s, Gervais Babington set out to dispel the anxieties with which he thought Puritans were most often troubled. The last of which was, I fear my nature if persecution should arise for religion. Puritans worrying that they wouldn't stand firm. Babington's description of how he dealt with this fear, whensoever I think of this matter, makes it sound like an almost everyday event. And for some it may have been. Satirists lampooned those who wished to become a martyr like those in Fox's book. But it was no joke. One seven-year-old girl in the early 17th century who found herself tempted to deny her faith 
began, as she said, to examine myself on this manner. What wouldst thou do if thou shouldst be tempted to deny Christ and be called to suffer for his sake, as some of thy kindred were in Queen Mary's time? Grace Mildmay believed that the effect of reading martyr stories was to encourage believers manfully to suffer death and to give our lives for the testimony of the truth of God. Elizabeth Jackson was said to have been very mindful of the fiery trial which might come upon us. And she, for her part, looked for it and prepared for it. This in England in the 1610s, when no fiery trial was to be expected. Yea, she was minded rather to burn at stake than ever to yield unto popery or to betray the truth of the gospel. Now, the danger of these fiery trials is pretty distant, but their value to Protestants, to Puritans, struggling against routine and hypocrisy was unmistakable. And, and this kind of thing could be genuinely frightening. Another little girl, the eight-year-old Elizabeth Isham in 1617, was alarmed by adults who she described as being of the preciser sort when she heard them talking about potential Catholic invasions and the horrors that might follow. Hearing of the joys of those martyrs, she said, that suffered for the Protestant religion, I was at this time very apprehensive of their blessedness. Lewis Bailey's the practice of piety, which is by far the, the most popular devotional book of the 17th century, covered all eventualities. If God calls believers to, to the honour to suffer martyrdom, he warned, that martyrdom might be by open burning, as under Queen Mary, by secret murdering, as under the Spanish Inquisition, by outrageous massacring, as in France, or by being blown up with gunpowder, which in the reign of James I needed no explanation. However your martyrdom might come, what mattered was living in readiness for it. So he said that we may seal with our deaths the evangelical truth which we've professed in our lives. What better ending to the drama of your life could one hope for? If you did not want to contemplate being burned, massacred, or blown up, you could use, use martyr stories analogically. Fox himself envisaged this. He believed that the martyr's example ought to encourage readers to stand more stoutly in battle against our adversaries, by which he meant temptations to sin and worldliness in the present. When Cecilia Dews died in 1618, her husband, wrote a long account of her exemplary pious death. And he wrote it, he said, at the beginning of a large book of martyrs, so into the blank pages at the front of the book, setting her struggles and triumph alongside those of Cranmer, Latimer and Ridley. Fox himself described the victims of plague as martyrs. Not even death was necessary for this kind of martyrdom. Richard Sibbs, the a great preacher of Charles I's reign, said that simple struggles with temptation make the life of many good Christians almost a martyrdom. But one thing martyrdom does traditionally require is a persecutor. This mentality helped to make Puritans unusually ready to interpret any opposition as persecution. Anti-Puritans, Anyone who laughed at or disdained Puritan practices or their demeanours, even anyone who questioned their judgment on a particular religious question, such people were easily cast as persecutors. And this for the simple reason that Puritans needed and expected persecutors. They reveled in persecution of this time. Sometimes they sought it out. Samuel Rogers wrote in his diary, all the house against me as too strict, but I have comfort in it. In George Gifford's dialogue between a Puritan and a countryman, the countryman wishes mildly that the Puritans would become better subjects to their queen. The Puritan responds with disproportionate 
self-righteousness. I must suffer your reproach, for if they have called the good man of the house Beelzebub, how much more those which be of his household. There are many other ways we could tell the story of how Puritans lived their lives, but I've chosen this way through this material in the hope of persuading you that this emotional perspective on the Puritan experience is both revealing and consequential. By beginning from the inner devotional experience, the problem of how Puritans interpreted the shape of their own lives and dealt with the problem of sanctification, I hope I've shown you how these apparently deeply inward struggles could lead to Puritans constructing themselves and their lives in such a way as to accentuate their divisions with their conformist and anti-Puritan neighbors. It could lead them to seeking out and cherishing anything that could be interpreted as persecution. And in the end, it could split English society down the middle, leaving the Puritans with a particular horror of settled peace something which no Puritan whose life was consumed by the struggle with sin could see as anything other than a defeat. The devil does not surrender. I will not quite say that it was the devotional character of Puritanism that tipped England into civil war in the 1640s. But I will say that that character made Puritans ready to expect such a war to accept it when it came, and to fight it, and to win it. It was, we might say, a continuation of their prayers by other means. Thank you very much for making it through to the end. My email address is on the screen. If anybody has any questions arising from this, I'd be more than glad to hear from you. I'm only sorry I couldn't have been there in person. Thank you very much.